Let's look at one of the absolute best fighting swords you can own as a genuine antique from the 19th century. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator at and Easton Antique Arms. Now, I'm going to put this sword down and we'll get to talking about that in a minute. But some years ago now, I think probably a couple of years ago, I made a video about this wonderful 1788 pattern heavy cavalry sword. And I extolled its virtues. And it is a fantastic sword. But as I mentioned in a follow-up video, it is a large cavalry sword. And I think probably in its current size, fairly unwieldy for a lot of people uh, wanting a practical fighting sword. Uh, now, obviously, why would someone want a practical fighting sword in the modern world? The fact is, I think people, a lot of people just simply like to own a sword that they think is a very well-designed weapon, very efficient and very effective in a number of different uses. Now, on that note, before I go on, I'll just mention that, of course, Different periods have different le levels of technology, different designs, different areas of, in, of the world that have different preferences. And obviously, things move. So if you're in the 16th century, then clearly a rapier or a side sword or some sort of uh, back sword or broadsword is probably what you're going to be armed with. Uh, but here we're specifically looking at 19th century swords. And in many ways, actually, in terms of kind of how they're used, but also how effective they are. They're very comparable. 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century swords. There's not a lot to choose between them in how effective they actually are as swords, so long as they're well-made examples of their type. So what we're going to be looking at here is a sword which I think is criminally underrated and is actually not rare. So one of the problems, go back to 1788 for a second, this is a fantastic sword, but one of the problems with them is they are really quite difficult to get hold of. There's not a lot of them around, uh, and when you find one in semi-decent condition, they're really expensive now. But there is a type of 19th century military sword, which is not uncommon, which I consider one of the best fighting swords that you can possibly buy for a red relatively modest amount of money. But very quickly before I delve into that and explain to you why I think this is such a great buy and such a great sword that you should add to your collection as soon as you can do and you won't, you won't regret it, um, we're very quickly going to have a quick word from our sponsors for this video and the channel. Today's kind sponsors for this video are Historic Mail. Not chain mail, mail. And in this wonderful internet age where we can research lots of historical sources online, we kind of miss that tangible paper feeling of being able to look at historical documents in person until now. Historic Mail is the perfect gift for someone who's got everything and helps you or them re-engage with the lost art of letter writing. Via the medium of historic letters, real historic letters written by famous historical people, delivered straight to your door. It was a bunch of history enthusiasts who came up with the idea, and it means that you or one of your loved ones can get letters by people like Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Edison delivered straight to your door as if they were writing to you. These letters get delivered straight to your doorstep or someone who you're giving it to as a gift, and you've got the letter inside, you've got historical context. It's a wonderful gift, and it's a great way of re-engaging with the way that people received information in bygone years. Through these letters, you learn things about some of these famous historical people that you've heard about, some little details about their life that you probably didn't know about at all. And Historic Mail also offers an American history pack, which goes from 1776, the founding, all the way through to 1976 and the height of the Cold War, the year I was born incidentally. And that features letters from the likes of George Washington, Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln and more. But also other important American figures like Walt Disney, Tesla and Twain. I'm sure you know that I've been thinking a lot about your troubles during the past month. <laughs> troubles. To put it lightly, Historic Mail offers 10 weekly letters delivered once a week for $59.99, so it's a great gift. And there are other options such as packs of 25 letters, 52 letters, and so on. So why not surprise the history lovers and your family this holiday season with the perfect gift and enjoy 10% off right now with the holiday season sale? You can go to historicmail.com slash scholar to get your discount, your gifts, and help support the channel. So check out this amazing offer. The link's right down below there in the description box. And I hope that either you or your loved ones really enjoy this amazing gift. And thanks once again to Historic Mail for sponsoring this video and the channel. Thanks a lot for sticking with me now. Let's get back to the main content of this video. So, without beating around the bush, what is this sword? Right, let's grab one here. Now this is a particularly good example made by Wilkinson and it's a patent solid hilt. 
Two things I'll mention about that before I go into what this model of sword is and why I think it's so good is of any military model of sword, and this is an officer's sword, um, so these were private purchase, okay? So unlike government purchased and issued weapons to troopers, to private soldiers, these were purchased from retailers or sometimes directly from the maker themselves. In this case, this is an example made by Wilkinson. Now, if you're buying any particular um, pattern, try and get one of the good makers if you can, if it's an officer's sword. So uh, if it's a British officer's sword, for example, as will be the case in, in this particular um, example, then look for Wilkinson, Pillin, Mole, Thurkle, Garden, although that's earlier, um, Manton, usually good, Often certain, so those are makers, often certain retailers such as uh, Hawks or Hamburger usually are high quality retailers and so they generally procured high quality well-made examples often made by people like Mole or Wilkinson or Pillin and then with their uh, sort of branding stuck on it. So fundamentally, if you're looking to buy one of these or any other model of sword, in fact, from uh, the Victorian period, from the British Empire, try when you can to get examples made by good makers. Uh, so for example on my website I always list if something's known to be made by Pillin or Thurkel or Wilkinson or Mole or whatever then I say that because that indicates it's a well-made example. So just with any model of sword, doesn't matter whether you're talking about 16th century uh, side swords and rapiers or whether you're talking about 19th century military swords, getting a well-made example will obviously be a far better sword than it could look exactly the same model of sword but not by, made by such a good maker, it won't be such a good sword. So clearly reliability, the fit and finish, uh, just how solid and how durable everything is, if you get a good maker it will be a better sword. End of, regardless of the design. And very briefly, as I mentioned, this is what's called a patent solid hilt, which is a uh, full width tang. And this is something which a few makers like Wilkinson and Pillin offered as a, a, an expensive optional extra. This does make this particular example even more desirable, even more expensive in the time and expensive today, in fact, um, and you could say stronger construction. In fact, we'll do a deep dive into the patent solid hilt in a video coming up soon. I've already filmed it, but I haven't published it yet, so that will be coming up. So I won't go into that here, but regardless of whether it's a patent solid hilt or not, uh, and in fact, you can get some absolutely fantastic examples of this model sword which aren't patent solid hilt, so don't worry and there'll be about half the, or even a third of the value of these. Um, get one of those anyway, it's still a great model of sword. So, without further ado, what is this model of sword? Well, it is the, univer the British uh, Universal Cavalry Officer's Sword of 1896, okay? So I refer to it as the 1896 pattern. In fact, uh, if you look in certain books, they will wrongly describe it as things like the 1887 pattern or whatever. But it's most correctly known, according to the dress regulations, as the model of 1896. Why? Quite simply because in that year, it became regulation for all British cavalry officers to carry this model of sword. And as I've said in previous videos, regardless of whether you've seen those or not, I'll repeat myself here, um, this is the model of sword, in my opinion, that British cavalry officers fact, should have had for decades period, already the and they should have kept it sort of probably until back. the modern day. It there is, is always a push and pull factor sword. between cut and thrust. Okay, It's very difficult well. to make a sword it's which is an amazing thruster that is also an amazing cutter. There is always compromise. So generally speaking, if you make a sword which cuts really well, in many, many ways, it's gonna mean that it usually isn't a very good thruster for a number of reasons. It could be the shape, it could be the curvature, it could be the width, um, it could be the cross-sectional, the flexibility, um, the edge geometry, a whole bunch of things when you combine all of those factors. Okay, so generally speaking, the best cutting swords in history are not fantastic thrusting swords. Okay, so in the 19th century, there was always this push and pull and there were certain sword uh, designers, makers, and there were certain people using swords out on the frontiers of the British Empire or even uh, in places like the, the Crimean War. Some people chose to go with more cutting designs, some people went with more thrusting designs. A tulwar is a good example of a cutting sword and what British infantry officers ended up with uh, from 1892 onwards, so 1892, 1895, 1897 patterns and still regulation today. This is an 1897 made by uh, Thurkle in this case. Um, this is 
a pretty much specialized thrusting sword. It's not to say it can't cut to some degree, but as you can see, it is a narrow tapered pointing blade. I've written articles about this. If you want to check out on the Eastern Antique Arms website, linked down below, you will find in the research section articles giving you a lot more in-depth information about this. So, infantry officers, it was decided, should have a thrusting sword at the end of the 19th century. That was where they ended up. And as it turns out, cavalry officers in the end from 1912 ended up with a thrusting sword as well. However, throughout most of the 19th century, and we could say throughout most of history, in fact, even if we're going back to the 16th century with many types of rapier and certainly most types of side sword and medieval sword, and if we look all around the world, if we look, you know, look at Highland broadswords or you look at... Um, basically most swords throughout history, even the Roman Gladius or Spatha, are compromised cut and thrust designs. So they're not optimized 100% for thrusting or 100% for cutting. Most swords in history have been some balance of compromise. And that's what the blade that we find on this 1896 pattern was. Now the blade itself is not new at all. It's an extremely successful blade known as the 1845 pattern blade. And in fact, it was devised by Wilkinson themselves. So the makers, uh, uh, the company that made this particular example, devised this blade in 1845. And it became regulation for infantry and cavalry and Navy, Navy in 1846, incidentally, um, and was an extremely successful blade. Now it could be a bit wider, it could be a bit narrower, it could be a bit more pointy, could be more curved or more straight, some were perfectly straight, but fundamentally it's a fullered blade where you have a fuller running up for the first two thirds or three quarters of the blade, and then it's double-edged spear pointed blade. In other words, what you have is a back sword blade. If we just come back to the 1788, for example, it's a little bit like this. It's a little bit like a scaled down version of this, and this is a very big cavalry sword incidentally. So this is usually, although they come in different sizes, this is scaled a bit better for uh, most people using them <coughs> in a combination of uses on foot and on horseback. It's a back sword blade up to a certain point. And then essentially above that, the tip of the blade, i.e. the bit that you might stab someone with, is double edged and spear pointed. That is the point is in the center rather than towards the back, which means that this blade is absolutely fantastically adapted for thrusting and is extremely similar to thrusting swords of the 16th and 17th centuries, okay? So the tip of this sword is very like side swords and certain types of rapier, kind of, kind of broader, more cut and thrust rapiers as well. So this is a really good compromise design and is fundamentally not that dissimilar to many types of sword which went before. And I would tell you, I've uh, cut with these um, over the years, sharpened up ones, and they perform really, really well. They handle very nicely. They've got a very uh, strong blade for parrying. So if you're defending down here against incoming attacks, this is a very strong portion of blade. They're usually only sharpened from about, in fact, this example is the same. This is sharpened from there upwards. So if you're parrying down here, you're essentially parrying with a blunt bit of blade. You're sharpened up here. This is a very strong section of blade uh, uh, with some benefits of something like an I-beam in construction. And then the part of the blade that you're predominantly cutting with up here is thinner. It's got very good edge geometry and uh, minimal resistance at passing through a target. Now, as I've pointed out, for the eagle-eyed amongst you who've watched a lot of my videos, you will know I'm a big fan of non-regulation swords. And so I'll just grab one of those as a comparison. This is a sword that I'm in the process of restoring at the moment. And this actually has an unfullered blade called a flat solid. And this is a Victorian heavy cavalry officer's sword uh, of 1859, made by Wilkinson. And, you know, some officers did prefer other types of blades. Some preferred an unfullered blade, some preferred a more curved blade, a broader blade, some preferred a more thrusting blade with double fillers and all sorts of combinations. And, you know, human taste, especially amongst swordsmen, is very individualistic. And so some will prefer one, some will prefer another. Okay, but... The 1845 blade is a great medium ground. It cuts pretty damned well. It is strong, it is durable, it's pretty good for parrying, and it's pretty good for thrusting as well. And you'll notice it is only very slightly curved. So you get a tiny bit of the benefit of curve uh, as far as cutting is concerned, but for point work and for using the point, you don't really lose anything in terms of the 
uh, opposition in the opponent's uh, with the opponent's uh, blade, binding with their blade and keeping the point online. And indeed, when you actually make contact with the enemy, the point is pretty much in line with the hilt. So a great compromise blade that I'm a big fan of. And it should be pointed out that lots of officers who did go for special order non-regulation hilts and grips and things like this, many of them kept the 1845 blade. So many people who are spending a lot of extra money on custom designed swords didn't go for a different model of blade. Even though they were experienced and practiced swordsmen, someone like Hodson, they still went for the regulation 1845 blade. So even experienced swordsmen who were fighting in places like India and Afghanistan and China and Sudan and these places back in the day actually using their swords, in many cases they'd used their swords on numerous people in fights, still chose this regulation 1845 blade. So you can probably gather from all of that, all of those words, that I am a fan of the blade. Now the guard. So the guard in this case is the heavy cavalry guard. Now this so-called, sometimes referred to as a la ladder hilt, actually has its origination, um, origin rather, in the Napoleonic period, in the 1796 heavy cavalry officer's sword. And that was the sort of prototype of what turned into this. So heavy cavalry officers had a guard very similar to this from 1796. And then this version comes in in 1821. And then really doesn't change very much from 1821 all the way through to 1896. And in fact, it doesn't get replaced, at least officially, until 1912. So this guard was extremely popular. Now, Something that's very interesting is throughout the 19th century, certain officers went for non-regulation guards. And um, one of the things that they tried to do was get more protection and more symmetry. Now, what's interesting is this guard doesn't need it. So this particular sword here that I just flashed before actually is an earlier heavy cavalry guard. So these are on paper the same model guard. Now, you'll notice one slightly longer, and I'll come to that in a second. But fundamentally, they are both the heavy cavalry guard. And um, this is for someone who was in the 4th uh, Royal Irish Dragoon Guards. And um, it works. It's a really, really good protective guard with perforations in it uh, that mean that you can use thicker steel so it's strong without it becoming too heavy. By having these holes in the guard, um, it reduces the weight of it while still having a lot of protection. Now, some of you might go, couldn't a point go through there? Not really. Most sword points wouldn't fit through one of these holes. But some people did put leather or buff leather, which is very difficult to penetrate, guards um, or rather liners inside the guard as well. So if you wanted extra protection, you could put a buff leather guard inside the guard. And someone like Fred Burnaby, if you don't know who he is, look him up, um, a sort of hero, I suppose, you could call him a madman, a hero, I don't know, a legend anyway, of the Victoria, late Victorian army who died in the Sudan, <clears throat> fighting against um, Sudanese warriors, got stabbed in the throat with a spear. But his sword, which remains in the Horse Guards Museum uh, to this day, actually has a liner of thin sheet steel painted white. So it looks like the buff leather lining, but is actually made of steel as well. So you can make it even more protective if you want, but obviously that comes at a cost of weight. So we've looked at the blade, a great compromise blade, um, the guard, and also once the, one other important thing to say about the guard actually <clears throat> is they are more symmetrical than most guards out there. So if you are a lefty, if you're a left-hander, you can hold these left-handed and still have a decent amount of protection. Now they aren't completely symmetrical usually, some are, but they do project more on the right-hand side for a right-handed person than the left, but they are more symmetrical than most guards out there, okay? So that's a good thing, but if you look around, you do actually find some which are almost purely symmetrical. I do actually have one in my collection, which is a custom-made sword, which is 100% symmetrical. It's repeated left and right. Um, now, aside from, you might be thinking, well, I'm right-handed, so that doesn't matter, as most of you statistically probably outside out watching now are right-handed. But there's another advantage to that symmetry, and that is balance. Now, one of the problems with some of the guards, and I'll just grab this 1897 as an example, is that the guard projects a lot more on one side than the other, which obviously makes them rather horrible for a left-handed person. But it also gives a slight twist, a slight um, overbalance on the right-hand side. 
Now with a thrusting sword that's not, not so much of a problem, but with a cutting sword it can mess with your edge alignment a bit if your sword is more weighted on one side than the other. Uh, and this is even mentioned in period sources. This isn't just Matt Easton's view. This is mentioned in things like Colonel Mary Mong's uh, treatise, A Memoir on Swords, and various other things. John Latham spoke about it as well. So a, a um, equibalanced or symmetrical guard. Funnily enough, if we go all the way back to the 1788, it's one of the things I like about that. It's an equibalance, so equal left or right-handed, equal balance. That's great for edge alignment, um, and I would say, although these aren't 100% equibalanced, they are better than most, okay? So good guard, good blade. Finally, the grip. Now, if we just for a second go to the earlier heavy cavalry sword. So on earlier swords, you will notice the back, back strap, I call it a back piece is actually a more correct term for the period. Um, the back piece is usually slightly curved on these earlier ones, and it has a, just have a look here, it has a checkered thumb placer. Okay, now that checkered thumb placer is so that if you are thrusting or just using it with your thumb up, as I would do, for example, when I'm using a saber, well, not everybody does, it gives you a bit more friction for the thumb there, okay? Um, which is good, which is great. Um, and these heavy cavalry ones, or in fact all cavalry swords at this time, do have uh, checkered pommels as well. So you've got a checkered back piece here and a checkered thing here, but it's smooth and curved there. Now, what's interesting is, in 1895, the new infantry sword uh, came in with a completely redesigned back piece or back strap, depending which term you prefer. And this is number one, straighter, and number two, fairly checkered. And you'll also notice this top section up here is flattened off to provide a better platform or stable platform for the thumb. So in other words, the grip, and it was also slightly elongated as well, so there's slightly longer grip than earlier ones. So the grip's slightly longer, the back is com almost completely straight, it's got a flattened section for the thumb, and the whole thing is checkered, which means you've got more friction in your hand, which means you, it's much more easy to retain a really tight grip on this type of grip. So I've always argued, I might not like them as much aesthetically, but functionally, as a fencer, as a swordsman and sabreur, that is a more, uh, more useful back, back strap. And, and I would argue the best back piece on any sword anywhere in the world. The Italians had some good ones. The French ones are rubbish, in my opinion. Um, and the Prussian ones are not very good either. Um, I do actually have a Prussian sword here I'll talk about just very briefly. Um, but the British ones, in my opinion, are the best. And that's not just nationalism, patriotism, just purely from a functional point of view. I will say this uh, Prussian uh, cuirasses sword, which I'm a big fan of, I think it's a lovely, lovely sword. And I absolutely love the shape and the cant of the grip. Um, and that doesn't have a back piece at all. And that is one other option. And I have custom swords like this. And in fact, John Musgrave Waite, one of the main guys that I teach from his treaties, uh, actually, he prefers not to have a back piece at all and to just have the shagreen or shark skin, which I agree with, okay? I also prefer that in an ideal world. But the back piece has a purpose and the back piece is very good at making, at making a, a more robust and stronger construction to the hilt because it provides a completely metallic bridge down the back here which strengthens the wooden grip. If you are going to have a back piece I would say this is the best kind of back piece to have. So the 1896 copied that from the 1895 infantry sword and you'll see that here we have the fully checkered back piece all the way up there and nice and flat and square for the thumb up here. And the grip is a little bit longer, which gives you a bit more space to get the thumb up. Also important, particularly on horseback, where if you're uh, th giving point and thrusting in something with speed of horse, there is gonna be probably some ramming and pushing back of the grip, and that will help you retain the grip where it should be. Um, and also give you a bit more of a crumple zone, if you want to call it that, between the tip of your thumb and the inside of that guard. Obviously on the later swords, the 1908 and the 1912, that's improved yet further, that theory. But this is, remember, this is a cut and thrust sword. This is a sword which will do well on foot, on horse, um, charging at speed or in a melee. In my opinion, the 1912, which is the sword which officially replaced this, and note that lots of officers retained these and they continued making these after they'd been 
officially replaced by the 1912 pattern, we've got examples from George V's reign, from the First World War, of officers buying these because they didn't like the new 1912. This is a cut and thrust, more traditional fighting sword. So, I hope I've rattled through pretty, pretty quickly there, but I am a massive fan of these 1896 patterns. And honestly, this isn't me trying to sell you 1896 patterns because I actually don't have, I've only got a couple at the moment, but I would say if you're in the, uh, if you're in the sphere of buying antique swords or thinking you want to get your first antique sword, what do I buy? If you want a sword that really feels like a big, fighting sword and bear in mind these are cavalry swords so they're not super light but they're also not super heavy they're not as anything like as big and heavy as the 1788 so they're sort of in the realm of you know a 16th century side sword or a medieval arming sword in fact they're lighter than most medieval arming swords um, so they're they're relatively light but they are built for cavalry use so they're more robust than most infantry officers swords they've got a steel hilt instead of a brass one and as you can see it's a very protective saber guard it's not obviously as protective as the as a basket hilt or a 1788 hilt but that being said they're a lot lighter a lot lighter and a lot more handy and they don't interfere with your hand at all so for a saber guard just about one of the best guards you can get and as protective as things like the custom scroll hilts that were people were spending a lot of money to have on their swords to go to India in the 19th century. You've already got one on one of these essentially. So great guard, really good compromised blade, really handy, good on, good on foot, good on horse, a good sort of in-between sword, good in any practical, any sort of any fighting situation and a really, really secure, nice grip, very well designed grip that I consider one of the best grips that's ever been put on a uh, compromise fighting sword. It's not a specialized thruster, it's not a specialized cutter, but for doing both, for fighting on horse or on foot, a great, great grip, really well designed, usually well made. If you want to get one, try and get one by a good maker like Wilkinson, Mole, Pillin, Thurkel. Those are my probably my favorites. Um, but fantastic swords. These were carried in the Boer War. They were also carried in World War I. They were also carried in Afghanistan um, in between those years and also 1919, um, straight after World War I. So these are great, great swords and I think should get a lot more credit and a lot more love than they get. And I would say if you're only going to own one British antique sword, get the 1896. I hope this has been enjoyable to watch. Um, give us a thumbs up if you liked the video and I hope I'll see you back on the channel really soon. I have been Matt Easton and I will continue to be. Cheers folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.